I continue, uh, along with my wife Sharon, to worship there and, and have enjoyed the fellowship of that congregation for 24, uh, going on it's 25 years now. And uh, I know that a number of families have uh, been, when they've been here in the area, have worshiped with you. And just be greatly encouraged. This congregation has a reputation for faithfulness, for desiring to please God in all things, and to declare his name and declare his gospel. As we turn to Mark chapter 6, even as I wanted to mention in the prayer, we recall, as sometimes we are distracted from this truth, especially because of the work of some scholars who say, well, what particular view did this particular man in his particular context culturally and socially and at that time in history uh, have to say to us? And we have to take all of those things into account as we interpret what he said. Where was he coming from? We have to remember that these men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Even as Peter, who probably, most likely, whose eyewitness account is recorded a number of times in the Gospel of Mark by John Mark, who was um, <clears throat> kind of a, a protege of Peter's. Even there, Peter himself reminds us in his epistle that the word of God, the word, the prophetic word, was more reliable even than the eyewitness account. When we were with him on the mountain and we heard with our own ears God say, this is my beloved son. When we saw with our own eyes the glory of Christ as he was transformed. What is better than an eyewitness account? First hand, Peter tells us the word of God, the prophetic word. How were they to understand even what they had seen? God's Holy Spirit opened their eyes, opened their minds, even as Jesus promised he would, that they would understand the things that Jesus had said. He would call them to mind and they would speak and recall those things that God had to declare that gospel of salvation. When we come to our passage here, though we are, although we are speaking, we are reading a, an inspired account, it is an inspired account about real people and what they really did, what really happened in the real world. And so here we have the apostles returning to Jesus. They have returned. We have a short interlude here uh, in between in Mark chapter 6. The, <clears throat> he has sent out the 12 apostles. He has told them to go. Don't take any staff. Don't take any bread, bag, money. Wear the sandals on your feet. And go and declare the good news of the gospel of the kingdom. And you are completely reliant on whoever is going to take you in. And so they have seen great things happen. Uh, Luke especially records how excited the apostles were when they, or the disciples were when they came back. And they said, oh, the great things. Even the demons submitted to us in your name. And Jesus said, I saw Satan himself fall from heaven. Indeed, they had seen great things, but it must have been exhausting. They must have thought, well, it's a job well done, and we've seen God do great things, but you know what? We could probably use a bit of a break. And Jesus, here he says, well, that's exactly what we need. Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And so they went away in the boat to a desolate place. 
This invitation would obviously have an immediate appeal to the weary disciples. Indeed, many a harried pastor has pondered this text longingly, even using it to preach sermons about how the occasional need for, you know, we need a little rest and recreation once in a while. If Jesus and his disciples needed it, surely we shouldn't feel guilty about taking a break now and then. And, you know, and so a pastor may say, appealing to this passage, to his session, now about my vacation allowance, for example. You know, perhaps we need to discuss that. After all, we have in the word of God, Jesus telling his disciples, you need to take a little bit of rest. You need to take a little bit of a break once in a while. Well, it didn't work out so well in this case, did it? Here with all these plans, and it seems that they were set aside. It seems that they were interrupted because the text does not end in verse 32. They went away to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. Jesus knew what he was about to do. Jesus was never overcome by events that he did not foresee. As is typical of the Lord, he has much more in store for his own than they could possibly anticipate. Remember, Jesus had come to fulfill the law and the prophets. Prominent in the history of God's dealings with his people is his leading them out into the wilderness, leading them into a desolate place. And looking forward to granting them rest. When God led Israel out of Egypt, he took them into the wilderness. And if David could say, oh, that I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. Yes, I would wander away, I would lodge in the wilderness. Then surely Israel was glad to be freed from their bondage and their toil in Egypt. And everything was fine until it dawned on them that they would naturally expect to be deprived of the things necessary to sustain them in the wilderness. And so it isn't long before they're saying, has the Lord led us out into the wilderness to die of hunger and to die of thirst? Yes, those desert isles look romantic and relaxing indeed until you realize, what are you going to eat? What are you going to drink? What kind of rest is that going to be? And so here, what has happened? Jesus has given a promise, a promise of rest to his disciples. But it seems that immediately it is snatched away. What we will see in this passage is that Jesus keeps his promise, but in a much greater way than the apostles could have imagined at first. When we get to verse 33, it seems that all their plans for a nice little vacation just evaporated as they see the crowds who have gotten to their getaway ahead of them and are waiting for them. In fact, they had been looking for this. The crowds were watching. Which way is Jesus going to go? And his disciples with him. And so they got there to their place of rest, to that desolate place before, and they were waiting. So what happens? In verse 34, instead of intervening in some way to put off the crowds and to protect his disciples, salvaging their hope for some time off, Jesus has compassion on the crowd and he starts teaching them. Now, we are not told here. We probably get 
A little bit of impression of some ire on the part of the disciples when they are given the task of feeding all of the people. And they say, that's uh, going to be somewhat difficult to do, Jesus, uh, you know, with all due respect. But I really think, although the text doesn't say it here, that probably at least some of the disciples had the same kind of reaction as Jonah had. When God showed compassion on the Ninevites. You know, I knew he was going to do this. I hate it when he does this. Here we are. We're finally going to get a rest. We're finally going to get a break. I mean, we've been out there ministering. We've done great things for God. We've seen God do great things. And here we finally get a chance to rest. And what happens when we have the crowd? Does Jesus intervene for us? Does he say, look, you know, my, my, my disciples need a little bit of rest and, you know, take up for us. No, he has compassion on them. He welcomes them. Everyone sit down and I'll teach you. I knew he would do that. I just knew he would do that. Just like Jonah. There you go again, God, being compassionate, being merciful as if he weren't merciful to us. Well, all that leave and liberty has been canceled, the captain said. <laughs> but Jesus saw that this multitude were like sheep without a shepherd. When Israel's leaders strayed away from the Lord, this described their plight. This very same kind of language was used. When Ahab, king of Israel, is reported as having done evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who went before him. Then when the prophet Micaiah told King Ahab of the vision the Lord had given him about the upcoming battle in which Ahab would be killed, he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. Jesus has come to fulfill the promise that God would send a good shepherd. Among one of the most prominent places that is promised is in Ezekiel 34, where the corrupt shepherds are confronted and God promises to remove them, replacing them with one like his servant David, who will shepherd his people. And so here, the good shepherd had come and he had compassion on the multitudes. They were like sheep without a shepherd. He was their shepherd. Well, as if the crowd were not sufficient inter uh, interruption to their plans for a nice getaway, it now dawned on the disciples that there wasn't much to eat in this desolate place. It was great to have a break from the labors of their recent mission, just as it was great for the Israelites to be freed from their labors in Egypt. But what were they going to do for food in this wilderness? They suggest a solution in verse 36. They said, let them go to the nearby towns and let them all buy something to eat. You know, they, they can take care of themselves. Well, there were 5,000, you know, anyone who you know, cheats and goes to the end of the passage uh, and reads that, they realize this was a huge crowd. There were 5,000 men. According to parallel passages, uh, it says in Matthew, besides women and children. And so this is the way the crowd was counted, but there were well in excess of 5,000 people. The nearby towns like Capernaum and Bethesda had only about two to 3,000 inhabitants each. Can you imagine their markets seeing these crowds? What, what kind of lines would there have been you know, of standing in line to get some bread? actually was not a practical solution at all. Jesus answers by saying, well, you give them something to eat. The disciples' reaction mirrors that of Israel 
of old. Indeed, as it is recorded in Psalm 79, they had said, can the Lord set a table in the wilderness? And here the disciples are asking that same question. And their frustrated, disrespectful reply showed their unbelief. If we had 200 denarii, which is more than all of us have, I don't know if anybody had checked with Judas just to see how much money he had in his purse, but uh, we don't think we have 200 denarii, but even if we did, would they buy enough to feed this crowd? Well, if you figured the denarius bought a loaf of bread, pretty steep, but um, that would be 200 loaves of bread, 25 slices to a loaf, might be able to get one slice of bread for each of the men. And um, never mind the rest of them. So what about the women and children that Matthew's account tells us? They were there as well. So here we have Jesus' own disciples who had seen the power of God. They had seen demons cast out at the name of Jesus. Just as the Israelites had seen God lead them through the Red Sea, he had parted the waters. He had demonstrated that as only God can, he had intervened where nature failed. Naturally, you head into the Red Sea, you drown. But supernaturally, because of the power of God, you head into the Red Sea and you're protected. You walk through on dry ground. God, who has created all things and who governs all things, is able to do with his creatures whatever he wishes. And so, if he wants to make water stand in heaps, and he wants to allow his people to go through, and then let the waters come back together and drown his enemies, he can do it. Now, what kind of a stretch would it have been for the Israelites to think, you know, if he could do that, I notice I'm getting a bit peckish here. I'm a little hungry. I'm a little thirsty. Um, maybe, just like we did when we were facing our enemies, we call out, we cry out to God. No, instead they concluded there's no hope. They look at the situation around them. They look at that situation from the viewpoint of this world, thinking this world is all there is. What I can see and touch and hear and feel and taste that's all that really is. They are looking at the world, looking at their lives from the viewpoint of an unbeliever. And yet they had seen God work. It is so easy to look back on Israel and to look back on the disciples and say, what's wrong with them? Indeed, what is wrong? with us. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with me? When we have seen God's deliverances again and again, we've seen him prove what he says in Psalm 34. The angel of the Lord encamps with his people and he delivers the righteous man again and again. The righteous man has many troubles but the Lord delivers him from them all. And remember, when the scripture speaks of the righteous man, he's speaking of every one of you in this congregation. No matter your gender, you are all human beings, not only created in God's image, but having been redeemed in Christ, where there is no male or female. And so you all have that inheritance as sons of God. 
the inheritance of eternal life. You think of the wonderful things that, and, and you have the righteousness of Christ. You are righteous because you have the righteousness of Christ upon you. You are dressed in his righteousness alone. And the Lord, according to his word, has kept you. He has delivered you again and again. Now, faced with a fresh challenge, how many times does our faith fail? And do we say, oh no, this time it's hopeless. This time there's no way out. Now, the disciples did not blame Jesus here. They did not go as far as the Israelites had, where they actually attributed evil to God. They said, God has brought us out into the desert to starve us and to cause us to die of thirst. Would that we had died back in Israel, uh, excuse me, in Egypt. But the disciples... They did not get that far, but they were pretty frustrated. They did not see any way out. But Jesus keeps his promise. Despite the unlikelihood that there's any way out, actually the impossibility that there's any way out, by way of nature, Jesus keeps his promise by his divine power. The promise he had made is that he would take them, he said, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. And it seems that that invitation was completely forgotten. It had evaporated as this crowd comes and Jesus has compassion on them and he wants to teach them because they are eager to hear. Jesus here graciously deigns to include his disciples in the miracle he is about to perform. You give them something to eat. Then, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. They come back with the five loaves and the two fish, which the book of John tells us uh, were given by a young boy. Jesus then commands the entire crowd to be seated in groups of 50 and 100. And even if all the groups consisted of 100 each, there would have been at least 50 groups. Again, a huge crowd. But in verse 39, there is a significant detail. They sit down on the green grass. This was a desolate place, desolate in the sense that it was away from any civilization. But it wasn't a desert. It wasn't an ugly, barren place. Because it says they sit down on the green grass. Yes, it's in the wilderness, but not a desert. This was pasture land. And before Jesus, and we'll come back to that in a moment, before Jesus even breaks the loaves to begin distributing them, he looks up to God and he says a blessing. I'm reminded here, that even the Son of God looks to his Father and says a blessing. Then he divides the loaves and the fish. What follows is the most unassuming, non-sensational record of an absolute miracle that could have been performed by no one but God. Indeed, one of the central themes, if you uh, these days, an academician would call it a thesis. <laughs> One of the central themes of the book of Mark is that this Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God. And he is the Savior. He is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God. And so many of the accounts, so many of the incidents that are recalled there are are revealed to prove that Jesus indeed was the Son of God. And so here we have demonstrated something only God could do. No one but God 
can create out of nothing. We think of the amount it would take not only to satisfy the appetites of well over 5,000 people, but then to fill up 12 basketfuls of leftovers. It was simply not there in those five loaves and two fish. He did not multiply those loaves as if by some process of atomic fission. He says, nothing is said about how Jesus did it. Just as Genesis does not even attempt to describe how God created the world and all that is in it, he simply spoke and it was done. The world was not created by a process. It was not created through a process of development or another term would be evolution. That's not how God created things. He created them whole cloth, complete, finished. And how did he do it? What method did he use? Do we have an insight into God's flow chart? You know, what was his process, his step-by-step -step process? He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Jesus blessed the loaves and then he simply began to distribute them gave them to the disciples, and it, it says really that, that Jesus, <clears throat> we assume that his disciples helped him in the process, but it tells us, the text tells us Jesus gave them the, the loaves. He simply passed them out, and one would have to be able to create from nothing to do that, something only God could do. And yet, no flashing no big show, just simply God, the Son of God, providing bread. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's well to remember, yes, but even the bread itself was provided by him. This is the Son of God. This is the Word of God. Through him, all things were made, and without him was not anything made that was made. So Jesus demonstrated his deity. But even more than that, he demonstrated that he was the good shepherd promised in Ezekiel 34. Read this promise in Ezekiel 34, verses 11 16. Listen to these words. And see if this does not unfold the scene before us in Mark 6. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be their shepherd, be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. This was the good shepherd. And this indeed is not the final fulfillment of the promise of Ezekiel 34. But just as he would again and again in the Gospel of John, he would say here, I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the light of the world. Indeed, even as he revealed himself to Moses in the bush, I am. And so here, Jesus, by a miracle, 
snatches victory from the jaws of defeat. Naturally speaking, there was no hope of deliverance for the crowd. They could only expect to go hungry. In miniature, this is the plight of the natural man. Once his natural resources are cut off, he is without hope. <coughs> that is what the Israelites concluded as they came out of the wilderness. They were flush with the deliverance as they had come through the sea. And oh, it is just so wonderful to be free from that bondage in Israel. I don't know why I keep saying that. In Egypt. Uh, we are so glad to be free of that. And, but then they think, wait a minute. And they go back to thinking naturally, thinking in terms only of this world. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? But what did God do? God intervenes again and again miraculously. He has told them that the angel of the Lord will deliver them. And whenever we see the angel of the Lord referred to, not just an angel, but the angel of the Lord, that is the Son of God. He is the angel of the Lord accepts worship. He accepts a sacrifice given by Samson's parents. And so something that an angel, any angel would not do. So the angel of the Lord has gone before them in order to show as a foreshadowing that God would send his son to seek and to save the lost. The lost and the hopeless. He was our only hope because it would take a miracle to save us. That is what Jesus meant to teach his disciples in the feeding of the 5,000. He had, just as God had led the Israelites into the wilderness and caused them to hunger in order to see what was in their hearts, God the Son here is in the wilderness and causes them to hunger, to see what is in their hearts. The only way that God would be able to save his people from their sins. That mission which is captured in the very name that Jesus was given at birth would be to perform a miracle that only God could do. Just as only God can create from nothing, so only God can give life. So Jesus deliberately sets up a situation in which there's no natural solution for the hunger of the crowd. If it is allowed to continue, they'll die. They are probably not actually in any grave danger in this particular instance of starving. There would have possibly been some natural solution. Uh, everybody just go home. But the situation is sufficiently serious to make the point that Jesus wishes to make. Since he is God, he is able to save them from hunger and therefore from starvation and death. This is a sign that he is indeed able to save them from death. The death that they deserve. Remember, death is not the natural end of life. It is not as it is so often represented in our funeral services. It is not right or true at all to say, even of a man or woman who has lived into his or her 90s or hundreds, well, they lived a long, full life. And so um, it's wonderful to see that they lived that long, and now they come to their natural rest. Death is a curse. Death is the curse for sin. And death cannot be defeated unless sin is atoned for. And so what Jesus did, he bore the blame for our sins. 
for your sins, for mine, taking the punishment of death in your place, and then performing a miracle. Remember, it was by natural means that the Son of God was put to death. He was mortal. All you had to do was have enough uh, nails to nail him to the cross. And he would die like any other man would. He suffered the natural curse that God had put upon mankind, particularly for their sin. But where is the salvation in that? Yes, he took upon himself our sins. He died the death that all of us deserve to die when he, of course, himself did not deserve it. But our salvation could only be performed by a miracle, something only he could do. Any man could die, but only the Son of God could rise again. And so he rose again from the dead to eternal life. Even here, Jesus shows himself not only to be a teacher, as he taught the crowds, but a savior. So what has Jesus done here? He has actually fulfilled his invitation to the disciples, hasn't he? He hasn't been deterred from his plan to give them rest at all. He simply turns a, what would have been a small party into a great festive occasion. This is also meant to teach his disciples that he has much greater things in store for them than they could possibly imagine. He does make them lie down in green pastures, as Psalm 23 says. He throws wide the invitation and welcomes a multitude to join them. And so they all join in on this rest. This is just a great big church picnic. He turns a small party into a festive occasion and everyone can come. Here he also taught them and he has taught us as well that where nature fails, grace triumphs. Where natural life will eventually end in death because of our sin, eternal life is the gift of God which he freely bestows on those who trust. Not in themselves, not in this world, but in him who made and sustains all things and who rose from the dead. Don't ever, ever think that Jesus will disappoint you. Even when he says no to your natural expectations, and those expectations may not be sinful. Those expectations may be perfectly reasonable and lawful. He may say no, that he might give you something far better, something only he can give. A treasure which neither moth nor rust can corrupt, eternal life, which is the knowledge of Jesus Christ, his son. But by his own example, he would teach us how we are to love one another. Our brother, as he instructed us from the word of God, reminded us how we ought to be solicitous of one another and of one another's good name. We think of Peter saying, we are to love one another fervently from the heart. And Paul to, says that we are to consider one another as more important than ourselves, looking out not only to our own interests, but in the interests of others. Because that's what Jesus did. He poured himself out rather than thinking, I've got a schedule to keep, or the disciples thinking, we deserve some rest. Jesus poured himself out. He gave of himself. And so we are called upon as his disciples, as those who, who are united to him by faith. When we hear the phone ring, 
And you know how it is these days. You can go and you can read the display on it and you can see who it is who is calling. And it's that person that whenever I answer the phone, I can kiss the next two hours goodbye. And I think of all the things that I have to do. Now, if I'm honest, I have to admit, I do have the time. I could afford the time. I was perhaps thinking of sitting down and relaxing for a minute. I was thinking about uh, maybe, you know, having a cup of coffee and watching some television. Uh, it's not as if my wife or husband is, has stopped breathing and I need to call 911. Uh, it is that I have some, I, I just need a little bit of me time. And Jesus never did that. He never worried about his me time. He poured himself out. He gave himself up. But remember, look how things turned out for him. And his intention is that however much we in imitation of him and in union with him pour ourselves out and answer that phone and take that time and listen when we would rather talk. Take time with someone when we would rather do someone, something else. Thinking of their welfare, even as Jesus looked upon the multitude and had compassion on them. We know that our Lord Jesus Christ will give to us a much greater reward, eternal life which is the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, how we thank you for such a faithful Savior who in every way glorified and honored you. And how, what good news it was to hear from his lips, the Father himself loves us. And so we come and we call you Father as he taught us to. And we <clears throat> know that not only will you give us each day our daily bread, not only will you forgive us our debts, not only will you guard us and keep us from temptation and deliver us from the evil one, but you will indeed cause us to be sons and daughters, of the, as sons and daughters of the kingdom of God, free to do all your will as it is done in heaven. Oh, Lord, how glorious. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mm. Would you turn now to, um, let's see, all right, number 482, come unto me, ye weary, number 482, let's sing together. Let's stand as we sing. Hmm.